Veni Creator Spiritus, mentes tuorum visita, in ple superna gratia, que tu creasti pectora. like to start the talk on the seventh and last gift of the Holy Spirit in this series, which is the gift of wisdom. Now, it's a big one. They're all big ones. But Dom Geringe, by now you know that I'm basing most of these talks on Dom Geringe, sorry, the liturgical year, turn of the century, Benedictine abbot and founder, and actually uh, re uh, reintroduced Gregorian chant, responsible for the revival of Gregorian chant. Anyway, he considers wisdom the uh, greatest, in some sense, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the final, the culminating one, because, because he associates wisdom with actual union with God. We'll get to there, because I'll read him. But I also want to say some prayers, start the discussion with my personal favorite prayer for the gift of wisdom, which is from the Book of Wisdom, uh, chapter 9. And if you have a Protestant Bible, you'll be frustrated because they don't have the Book of Wisdom in there. So anyway, it has to be a Catholic Bible. Uh, it's one of the books that the Protestants decided to leave out. You'll have to ask Martin Luther about that if you see him. <laughs> Although, I hope, never mind. I mean, of course, I hope he's in heaven, but I certainly hope you guys get to heaven, which might make the odds of seeing Martin Luther a little bit iffy. Anyway, so let me read um, the prayer for wisdom from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 9. God of my fathers, Lord of mercy, you who have made all things by your word and in your wisdom have established man to rule the creatures produced by you, to govern the world in holiness and justice, and to render judgment in integrity of heart. Give me wisdom, the attendant at your throne, and reject me not from among your children. For I am your servant, the son of your handmaid, a man weak and short-lived and lacking in comprehension of judgment and of laws. Indeed, though one be perfect among the sons of men. If wisdom who comes from you be not with him, he shall be held in no esteem. You have chosen me king over your people and magistrate for your sons and daughters. You have bid me build a temple on your holy mountain and an altar in the city that is your dwelling place, a copy of the holy tabernacle, which you have established from of old. Now with you is wisdom who knows your works and was present when you made the world, who understands what is pleasing in your eyes and what is conformable with your commands. Send her forth from your holy heavens and from your glorious throne dispatch her, that she may be with me and work with me, that I may know what is your pleasure. For she knows and understands all things and will guide me discreetly in my affairs and safeguard me by her glory. Thus will my deeds be acceptable and I shall judge your people justly and be worthy of my Father's throne. For what man knows God's counsel or who can conceive what our Lord intends? For the deliberations of mortal are timid and unsure are our plans. For the corruptible body burdens the soul and the earthen shelter weighs down the mind that has many concerns. And scarce do we guess the things on earth, but when and what is within our grasp we find with difficulty. But when things are in heaven, who can search them out? Or who ever knew your counsel, except you had given wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from on high? And thus were the paths of those may on earth made straight, and men learned what was your pleasure, and were saved by wisdom. Amen. Now this is Solomon's prayer. 
Solomon said it, which is why there are references to you have chosen me king over your people and magistrate for your sons and daughters. And I'm going to go through this a little bit. It's a little bit of a add-on to the Dom Geringe discussion of wisdom. But I love, I've always loved this prayer. God of my fathers, Lord of mercy, you have made all things by your word. True, by the way. Nothing exists that God didn't design and make, including all those things that the misguided ones attribute to random chance, i.e. evolution. Anyway, and in your wisdom have established man to rule the creatures produced by you. Isn't that beautiful? This tells us why, I mean, what God, what man's role is, okay? It's to rule the creatures produced by you. We are supposed, we are supposed to run the world in the sense of Man is the highest of the worldly creatures. Remember that God paraded all of the animals in front of Adam and gave Adam authority over all of the animals. We are, we are stewards. We're stewards of the world. And we're supposed to govern the world in holiness and justice and render judgment in integrity of heart. So... It seems to me like a good definition of righteousness or whatever, right? Uh, to live in holiness and justice, to govern everything around ourselves in holiness and justice, and to render judgment in integrity of heart. Uh, give me wisdom, the attend at your throne, and reject me not from among your children. For I am your servant, the son of your handmaid, a man weak and short-lived, and lacking in comprehension of judgment and of laws. Now, we've gone through all of the other gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? And a lot of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are kind of recapitulated in this prayer because uh, we prayed for the gift of knowledge because we are not in a position to understand what God wants without a gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of knowledge. Uh, we're not in a position to judge rightly the right course of action without the gift of counsel. That's referred to in this prayer also. Um, Indeed, though one be perfect among the sons of men, if wisdom who comes from you be not with him, he shall be held in no esteem. I think one could argue that in the context of this prayer, wisdom encapsulates the other wisdom-like uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, that is, understanding, counsel, and knowledge. It's like the capstone of them. Um, now, now this is pretty cool, if you let me say so. You have chosen me king over your people and magistrate for your sons and daughters. I'll let that one go by because we're not Solomon and we're not king. However, we do always have a lot of people under us one way or another. If we're parents, we have children under us. Um, we have interactions every day with people. And in some of those interactions, we are in a position of power. And that power is a tremendous responsibility because we should be doing everything for God, including the way we exercise whatever influence or power we have over other people. And so we certainly need the gift of wisdom because we are incapable of um, rendering proper justice, rendering proper judgment, or being magistrates, so to speak, for God's other sons and daughters uh, in whatever to whatever extent we have that kind of authority over them. And parents, of course, have total authority over their children. Anyway, but this is the part I want to underline. You have bid me build a temple on your holy mountain and an altar in the city that is your dwelling place, a copy of the holy tabernacle which you had established from of old. Now, in the context of Solomon's prayer, Solomon is referring to the fact that he was chosen by God to build the temple in Jerusalem, right? Solomon's temple. But we know something else. We know that with the coming of the Holy Spirit, with the coming of Jesus and the leaving behind of the Holy Spirit, 
our souls, our hearts, are the dwelling place of the Most Holy Trinity. Our hearts are the temple, the new temple of God. It's the new temple of Jerusalem. What used to be the temple in Jerusalem where God dwelt is now the human soul through Christianity, through the sacraments, through the baptism, through being in a state of grace. So, although Solomon was referring to his temple, you have bid me build a temple on your holy mountain and an altar in the city that is your dwelling place, right? Right? The city that is God's dwelling place, you can think of as us. And the, um, the, you know, the altar, the holy tabernacle in that city is our hearts with the indwelling Holy Spirit, right? You have bid me build a temple on your holy mountain and an altar in the city that is your dwelling place, a copy of the holy tabernacle, which you had established from of old. It's not only a copy of the Holy Tabernacle, it's actually the realization of what the Holy Tabernacle was in some sense a foreshadowing of. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the rest of this, but um, it's, it's, it's a Wisdom Chapter 9, and uh, it's all incredibly beautiful, and it's all kind of in a way it, it it wraps up in a beautiful bundle with a bow much of what we've been talking about about the gifts of the holy spirit scarce do we guess the things on earth and what is within our grasp we find with difficulty but when things are in heaven who can search them out we talked about that when we talked about the gift of understanding last time or whoever knew your counsel except you had given wisdom and sent your holy spirit from on high we talked about that when we talked about the gift of counsel and thus were the paths of those on earth made straight, and when lo men learned what was your pleasure. We talked about that when we talked about the gift of knowledge, right? Knowing what God wants, and we're saved by wisdom. Amen. Okay. Okay. Um, Dom Garanje. Um, and what he has to say about the gift of wisdom. He's very, um, he takes it very seriously. As I said, he actually, I'll recap just a bit from the previous talk on the gift of understanding. Dom Geringer's schema, so to speak, is that the first five gifts of the Holy Spirit perfect our actions, influence our actions, get us on the right path in our actions, fear of the Lord, of course, piety, counsel, knowledge. And I knew I wouldn't get all five off the top of my head. Oh boy, fortitude, fortitude. And they are, they're, all, they're all guides and um, inspirations and strengthening for our actions, for what we do, what we do in our own interior path of perfection, what we do with others and so forth. But the last two, the gift of understanding and the gift of wisdom, are essentially more like pure consolations. They are interior experiences that give us a foretaste of heaven. We talked about that with the gift of understanding. And in Dom Geringer's schema, the gift of wisdom is the ultimate union with, basically, union with God. Jesus being incarnate wisdom, union with God that's available during this life on earth. That's just a little, setting the stage a little bit. So let me, let me go to his text now. The second favor destined by the Holy Spirit for the soul that is faithful to him in action the first five gifts were necessary for the soul to be faithful to God in action, is the gift of wisdom, which is superior to that of understanding. The two, however, the two are, however, connected together inasmuch as the object shown by the gift of wisdom is held and, re excuse me, I'm going to start this sentence over. The two, however, are connected together 
inasmuch as the object shown by the gift of understanding is held and relished by the gift of wisdom. In other words, the object of the gift of understanding is the same as the object of the gift of wisdom. The difference is that in the gift of understanding, a light is shown on the, let's say, supernatural truth, on the mystery of God that we're getting the illumination on, whereas with the gift of wisdom, it's more of a union with that mystery, more of a participation in that mystery, rather than a insight or understanding or a mental enjoyment, let's say, of that mystery. Continuing, when the psalmist invites us to draw nigh to God, he bids us relish our sovereign good, quote, taste and see that the Lord is sweet. Holy, Go Holy Church prays for us on the day of Pentecost that we may relish what is right and just, because the union of the soul with God is rather an experience or tasting than a sight, for such sight would be incompatible with our present state. The light given by the gift of understanding is not intuitive. It gladdens the soul and gives her an instinctive tendency to the truth, but its own final perfection depends upon its union with wisdom, which is, as it were, its end. So again, there's that distinction between understanding and wisdom, where wisdom is a light, excuse me, understanding is a light of understanding that's shown for us, shines on us, whereas wisdom is a union. Con continuing, understanding therefore is light, wisdom is union. Now, union with the sovereign good is attained by the will, that is, by love, which is in the will. Thus, in the angelic hierarchy, the cherubim, with their sublime intellect, are below the seraphim, who are inflamed with love. It is quite true that the cherubim have ardent love and the seraphim profound intelligence, but they differ from each other by their predominating quality, and that choir is the higher of the two, which approaches the nearer to the divinity by its love and relish of the sovereign good. So again, the distinction is, in some sense, I'm oversimplifying. Uh, the distinction is a distinction between the intellect and the heart, and that understanding illumines the intellect, and wisdom is kind of like a union of the heart, is a relish, it's a tasting, it's a tasting and seeing how sweet the Lord is. It's a, um, it's an act of love rather than, than an act of understanding. The seventh gift I, I probably shouldn't have said that. I, I withdraw that statement as an act of love. However, it's, it's more in the realm of love than the gift of understanding is. The seventh gift is called by the beautiful name of wisdom, which is taken from its uniting the soul by love to the eternal wisdom. Uniting the soul through love to the eternal wisdom. This eternal wisdom who mercifully puts himself within our reach, even in this veil of tears, is the divine word whom the apostle calls the brightness of the Father's glory and the figure of his substance. That's in the letter to the Hebrews. It is he who sent us the Holy Spirit, that he might sanctify us and lead us to himself, so that the sublimest of the workings of this Holy Spirit is his procuring our union with him who, being God, became flesh, and for our sake made himself obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. By the mysteries wrought in his humanity, Jesus enabled us to enter within the veil of his divinity. By faith, enlightened by supernatural understanding, we see the glory of the only begotten of the Father, and just as he made himself a partaker of our lowly human nature, so does he give himself the uncreated wisdom, to be loved and relished by that created wisdom, the noblest of the gifts which the Holy Spirit forms within us. Wow, okay. Now, 
if you haven't missed any of these classes, so to speak, if you were with me through the talks on the Ascension, you see this incredible, beautiful continuity between the Feast of the Ascension and the Feast of Pentecost. Because what happened at the Feast of the Ascension was that Jesus, in his human nature, uh, ascended for the first time into the Most Holy Trinity, and his human nature, for the first time, flowed into the divine nature of the Most Holy Trinity, and human nature and divine nature, nature were commingled for the first time in creation forever and ever. And the gift, this, this, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit can be sent to us via this commingling of human nature and divine nature, which required the ascension. And that's why the uh, uh, ascension the, to the Pentecost, to Pentecost, is in a sense, it's one continual event, series of intertwined events. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are the fruit of this union between divine nature and human nature. And the ultimate gift of the Holy Spirit, the ultimate fruit of this union between divine nature and human nature is the ability, while still on earth, to have union, some sense, union with the divine nature through the gift of wisdom. I'm paraphrasing Dom Guerinje, but I think I'm doing a fair job. Um, so I'm, I'll reread that last, um, that last sentence in the light of what I just said. Just as Jesus himself made himself a partaker of our lowly human nature, so does he give himself the uncreated wisdom. Because Jesus had a human nature, but Jesus was also the uncreated wisdom of God, right? Um, so does he give himself the uncreated wisdom to be loved and relished by that created wisdom. That's the gift of wisdom in us, in creatures. The noblest of the gifts which the Holy Ghost forms within us. Continuing, happy then they who possess this precious wisdom, which makes the soul relish God and the things that are of God. The sensual man, says the apostle, perceives not the things that are of the spirit of God. That's in 1 Corinthians. And in order that he may enjoy this gift, he must become spiritual and docile to the teachings of the Holy Spirit. And then there will happen to him what has happened to thousands of others, that after being a slave to a carnal life, he will recover his Christian freedom and dignity. The man who is less depraved than the former, but still imbued with the spirit of the world, is also incapable of receiving or even comprehending the gifts of understanding and wisdom. The... Um, uh, the, I mean, I don't want to sound discouraging, be a buzzkill or whatever, but uh, Dom Guerinje makes it pretty clear that we can't be imbued with the spirit of the world and also imbued with the Holy Spirit. We really have to be indifferent to the spirit of the world. We have to be indifferent. Um, well, Jesus said it, right? He said, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. I don't know what mammon is. I know very often people say it's money, but I think it's the spirit of the world, essentially. And uh, the very first gift of the Holy Spirit that we talked about was the fear of the Lord, uh, which was in part intended to turn us, basically, to make us um, hearken to the desires of God, to the way God sees things, and not hearken to the demands of the spirit of the world or the way the spirit of the world sees things. In other words, to make us indifferent to worldly things and have all of our priorities be set by the spirit of God. And that was the very first gift, right? So, so Dom Guerinje is saying that basically that we really have to exercise those first five gifts that purify our actions 
in order to qualify, so to speak, to be given these um, rewards of the last two gifts, which really are rewards or foretastes of heaven in this life. The man, well, here, but the man who is still imbued with the spirit of the world is also incapable of receiving or even comprehending the gifts of understanding and wisdom. He is ever ridiculing those who he cannot help knowing possess these gifts. He never leaves them in peace, but is ever carping at their conduct, setting himself in opposition to them and at times seeking to satiate his jealousy by bitter persecution. I have a feeling Dom Garanje is speaking from his own experience here. Um, it's, it is definitely true that those imbued with the spirit of the world have the utmost contempt, contempt, right? Contempt at us holy rollers, at us who actually take all this stuff seriously, right? We have three heads. Um, the tragic thing is when Dom Garen Jay is talking about um, the men who are imbued with the spirit of the world never leaving those who are not in peace and ever carping at their conduct and seeking to satiate his jealousy by bitter persecution. I suspect he's talking about religious. I suspect he's talking about other monks and priests and so forth. Uh, and you certainly can see that today, right? You can see that. Look at the persecution of, am I allowed to say this? Bishops who really have the faith. You know, the persecution against uh, Cardinal Burke, the persecution against the Dubia Cardinals, uh, the persecution against, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank, uh, the, the Bishop of Tyler, Texas, uh, you know, that, that comes from their fellow bishops. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, at one of the meetings of the USCCB, I'm not sure it was the re most recent, I think it was five or six years ago, at least, when Cardinal Burke got up to speak, the, the meeting room burst out in laughter, laughing at him, the other bishops. Anyway, continuing. I'll look through the chat stream after the, heart, the mainstream of this talk so that this talk is not too swayed by the initial hearers anyway but i will look at it and 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 uh, respond to things jesus assures us that the world cannot receive the spirit of truth because it sees him not nor knows him there's no two ways around it you know you can't have one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat that's pulling away from the dock you'll just end up in the middle of the water nowhere uh we have to choose. We have to choose which master to follow. This doesn't mean we're going to be perfect at it. It doesn't mean we're not going to have slip ups, but we have to be aware. We have to be aware. We have to be conscious of where our priorities lie in principle, even if they don't always lie there in our actions. In other words, in other words, we are going to sin, we are going to slip up, but that doesn't mean that we get confused about what's right and what's wrong. Okay. They therefore who would possess the supreme good must for, first divorce themselves from the spirit of the world, which is the personal enemy of the spirit of God. If they break asunder the chain that now fetters them, they may hope to be gifted with wisdom. The special result of this gift is great vigor in the soul and energy in all her powers. Her whole life is, so to speak, seasoned with it. The effect may be likened to that produced in the body by wholesome diet. There is no disagreement between such a soul and her God, and hence her union with him is almost inevitable. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, says the Apostle, there is liberty. Everything is easy to the soul that is under the influence of the spirit of wisdom. Things that are hard to nature are sweet to such a soul, and suffering does not appall her as once it did. 
To say that God is near to her is saying too little. She is united with him. And yet, she must keep herself in an attitude of profound humility, for pride may reach her even in that exalted state, and and oh, how terrible would be her fall. I am going to um, take a very short break because I want to read some passages from St. Dieter Stein. There's a logic to why I'm doing this. I, I don't want you to get discouraged. I think that Dom Geringer at this point is uh, talking essentially about saints. I'm sure he's talking about saints. And um, I hope that we all become saints, but I don't have a very high expectation that I'll become a genuine saint. I don't, I don't have any expectation at all, to tell the truth. Uh, the most I could possibly hope for is martyr, I suppose. Um, because I don't think I'm, you know what I mean. Um, I, I don't have the, uh, I don't think I have the willpower, the self-discipline and so forth. Strickland, that's right. Uh, but let me read some quotes from Edith Stein, who was, I think, a genuine saint. And that shows this. She, okay, she's, she's on her way to Auschwitz, right? She's on her way to Auschwitz. She's in horrible, horrible, horrible physical suffering circumstances. Okay, I'll just read these quotes. Because remember, Dom Geringer said, uh, Things that are hard to nature are sweet to such a soul, and suffering does not appall her as it once did. So, okay, so here goes. I have complete confidence in God and have surrendered myself entirely to his will. I regard it as a grace and privilege to be driven along this road under these conditions. This is the road to Auschwitz. If our sufferings have been increased, then we have received a double portion of grace and a glorious crown is being prepared for us in heaven. Rejoice with me. I am going forward unshaken, confidently and joyfully to testify to Jesus Christ and to bear witness to the truth. We will unite our sufferings with the sufferings of our King sacrificing ourselves for the conversion of the Jews so that all may know the peace of Christ and his kingdom. She was walking the walk. She wasn't just talking the talk. Continuing with another quote from her, It is not human activity that can save us, but the sufferings of Christ. To take part in these is my aspiration. And um, maybe the last one that I'll read. Whatever did not fit in with my plan did lie within the plan of God. I have an ever deeper and firmer belief that nothing is merely an accident when seen in the light of God, that my whole life, down to the smallest details, has been marked out for me in the plan of divine providence. Okay, so, oh, and by the way, she smuggled out a letter. She wrote a letter when she was being shipped to the to Auschwitz, you know, sent by train, cattle car, to Auschwitz, they had a temporary internment camp called Westerbork. I think it was still in Holland. And um, they were unloaded. Actually, I think they were trucked to Westerbork. And then they waited there for five or six days for a train to take them to Auschwitz, for the cattle car to take them to Auschwitz. But the conditions at Westerbork were, were very, 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 very terrible. And um, she smuggled out a letter, miraculously. She wrote a letter in Westerbork, and uh, somehow it was smuggled out. I don't remember the details of how, and it made it back to her convent. And, and here she is in essentially a concentration camp. And uh, she writes, the, the prayer here is wonderful. The prayer here is superb. superb. So... I think that's the fruit of her union with God. It's not something that I personally aspire to in the sense of um, have any imagination that, um, you know, I, you know, that any normal person, so to speak, is going to reach that point. But I'm saying that because I think that Dom Geringer probably was a real saint and he's describing something that is very true 
and maybe, 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 maybe we'll get tiny little flashes of it. But the uh, state that he's describing of being immune from suffering, essentially, totally, in, I mean, indifferent to, to suffering, it becomes sweet and easy. You can, you can let me know afterwards if you've reached that point. Things that are hard to nature are sweet to such a soul, and suffering does not appall her as it once it did. To say that God is near to her is saying too little. She is united with him. And yet she must keep herself in an attitude of profound humility, for pride may reach her even in that exalted state, and oh, how terrible would be her fall. Let us, with all the earnestness of our hearts, beseech the Holy Ghost to give us this wisdom, which will lead us to our Jesus, the infinite wisdom. One who was wise under the old law aspired to this gift when he wrote these words, of which we Christians alone can appreciate the full meaning. This is now a quote from the Book of Wisdom. It's actually a quote from Solomon, if I'm not mistaken. I wished and, un I wished and understanding was given to me, and I called upon God, and the Spirit of Wisdom came upon me. In the New Covenant, we have the Apostle St. James thus urging us to pray for it. If any of you want wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men abundantly, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, without any wavering. O Holy Spirit, we presume to follow this injunction of the Apostle and say to thee, O thou who proceeds from power and wisdom, give us wisdom. He that is wisdom has sent thee unto us, that thou may unite us to him. Take us from ourselves, and unite us to him who united himself to our weak nature. O sacred source of unity, be thou the link, uniting us forever to Jesus. Then will the Father adopt us as his heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Amen. Amen. And thank you. Thank you for watching. I am going to close. You know how much I hate to leave you, so I'm always closing three or four times. I'm going to close by reading the entire prayer of Solomon, a different prayer of Solomon for wisdom, which uh, Dom Guerinje alluded to in that final prayer. So here goes, it's from Wisdom chapter 7. Therefore I prayed, and prudence was given me. I pleaded, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her to scepter and throne, and deemed riches nothing in comparison with her, nor did I liken any priceless gem to her, because all gold in view of her is a little sand, and before her silver is to be accounted mire. Beyond health and comeliness I loved her, and I chose to have her rather than the light, because the splendor of her never yields to sleep. Yet all good things together came to me in her company, and countless riches at her hands, and I rejoiced in them all, because wisdom is their leader, though I had not known that she is the mother of these. Simply I learned about her, and ungrudgingly do I share her riches I do not hide away. For to men she is an unfailing treasure. Those who gain this treasure win the friendship of God, to whom the gifts they have from discipline commend them. That's what we were actually talking about, the first five gifts and then and the last two, whom, to whom the gifts they have from discipline commend them. In other words, they've already cleaned up their act. Now God grant I speak suitably and value these endowments at their worth, for he is the guide of wisdom and the director of the wise, for both we and our words are in his hand as well as all prudence and knowledge of crafts. For he gave me sound knowledge of existing things, that I might know the organization of the universe and the force of its elements, the beginning and the end and the midpoint of times, the changes in the sun's course and the variations of the seasons, cycles of years, positions of the stars, natures of animals, tempers of beasts, powers of the winds and thoughts of men, use of plants and virtues of roots. Such things as are hidden I learned and such as are plain, for wisdom 
the artificer of all, taught me. Wisdom through whom all things were created. Jesus, who was wisdom incarnate, through whom all things were created. Okay, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed this series. And um, you know me by now. I'm not going to stop talking, so stay tuned for, for what comes next. Bye for now. Veni Creator Spiritus, mentes tuorum visita, in plesu per na gratia, que tu creasti pectora. Speed.